Hi everyone, this is going to be a tutorial on how to install a 10 gigabit PCIe card in your Synology NAS. Only certain models of Synology NASs have PCIe expansion slots, so make sure to check compatibility before purchasing any, anything. I've included in a link below all the NASs that you can install PCIe expansion cards on. The main advantage of having a 10 gigabit connection is it removes the largest bottleneck with a NAS, which is the one gigabit ports. There are eight bits in one byte. That means that a one gigabit connection can only transfer 125 megabytes per second. That means that that's a very large bottleneck considering hard drives can generally do 190 megabytes per second. Then, once you put them in a RAID, you could easily have 500 megabytes per second read and write, but you cannot get to that connection due to the bottleneck from your network interface. Instead, you can install a 10 gigabit connection. This allows you a theoretical 1.25 gigabytes per second read or write from the NAS. This will eliminate basically any bottlenecks you have until you get on flash arrays. Synology has announced, but has not given a date for, a new PCI card. It will have both two M.2 SSDs and a 10 gigabit card on there. That means you will not have to choose between, due to the fact that almost all Synology NASs, if they come with a PCI slot, it will generally only have one, so you've always had to choose between ultra-fast SSDs or removing the bottleneck caused by one gigabit connections. However, that date has not been announced, and it could be in 2021 before we see them. For this, I'm using the Synology 1 10 gigabit card. It was about $130, but I chose to do it over a third party one, knowing that it will always work. And I will admit, when using my NAS, I tend to err on the side of caution. I've also included a link of all the compatible 10 GBE cards. For a normal network setup, you're going to need a 10 gigabit switch. For me, I'm using the $200 Netgear 10 port switch. This has eight regular one gigabit ports and then two 10 gigabit ports. For me, this is perfect. It gives me 10 gigabit to my NAS and to my computer. However, you can go directly from the 10 gigabit card directly into your computer. This, however, gives you a weird network setup and is a little bit more complicated. I'll have another video on that later. Right now, for 10 gigabit use on my computer, I'm using this. The OWC 10 gigabit to Thunderbolt 3 adapter. This thing has worked perfectly for me so far and I've not noticed any bottlenecks from it. Although I will say one thing, if you see how large this thing is, it's due to the fact that it's got to have a big heat sink because it produces a lot of heat. Even one gigabit converters produce a lot of heat, so be careful with that. When using a 10 gigabit connection, you should use at least CAT6 cable. CAT5E will give you 10 gigabit, but only under short distances and can have a lot of interference. The reason I use my Synology is I've got long cable runs about 100 feet from my room to my setup, so I created my own CAT6E cables. There's a lot of tutorials online about how to do that, and it's actually fairly inexpensive. All right, now on to actually installing the 10 gigabit card. First, you're gonna to wanna to boot down your NAS and make sure all virtual machines have stopped. Then, unplug everything and pull it out. First, you're going to want to remove the six screws on the back to give you access to the panel. Once you've removed the panel, you can now have access to the PCIe switch. Remove the cover and then simply slot in the 10 gigabit card, making sure that all the connections are secure. Then once it's been secured properly, slot back down the cover and screw it in to make sure it is secure. After this, it should be properly installed. You can do a boot up here, but it is unlikely you're gonna have problems, so simply just put the cover back on. I will admit, getting the cover back on is a lot harder than getting it off, so it might take you a minute. To get the cover back on, you want to first put it on the top and then slot it forward. There are two pegs that should align. After that, it works. It may take you a few minutes though. 
After you've got the cover back on, screw it on and you're good. Now you have a 10 gigabit connection to your NAS. Using the appropriate RJ45 cables, connect it to your computer either using a switch or directly. Now that we've installed our 10 gigabit card and hooked it up to our network, let's go through and actually configure it. There is a weird thing where if you're still using your one gigabit ports, you wanna make sure to distinguish between the 10 gigabit port and the one gigabit ports. So for me, the way I've got this set up is using two distinct IP addresses. I know that whenever it's 192.168.1.110, 10 for 10 gigabit, I know that that means that I'm on my 10 gigabit connection. This is helpful when you want to have failover using your one gigabit connections, but want to make sure you can always connect using 10 gigabit. So the way to do this is go into control panel on your DSM, network, and then go to your network interface. Here we can see we've got my LAN 5, which is my fifth network interface. The first four are one gigabit and we can manually set this up by going to edit. By default, your router actually will assign you an IP address to every single port you specify. If you want to configure it yourself, which I would recommend doing, go to manual configuration, type in the IP address you'd like to use. As a note, this can cause problems if a computer first steals this port before your NAS can actually connect to it. The way I've gotten around this is to only have my router give out addresses under 100. That means that any address between 192.168.1.1 and .100 are going to be randomly assigned based off my router. Then I have myself sectioned out all the other ones for whatever I want to do with it. I assume that there's not going to be more than 100 random people connecting to my network at once, but if you wanted to, you could go up to 200, or if you want to get really fancy, you could start using different subnets, but if you're doing that, you're not watching this tutorial. So you're going to specify your IP address. Most default networks use the 192.168.1. blank. That is your go-to router, and the reason that is used is the subnet 192 is never assigned anything but a local network. That means that no public IP address will ever start with 192, so your router knows for fact that that will not interfere with anything else. If you have a different subnet used, sometimes it's 10.1.0.x, then enter that here, whichever port you want to use. But for most of you, I would say that 192.168.1 gives you free reign. On subnet mask, if you don't know anything about subnet masking, simply put this to 255.255.255.0. That basically means lock in your first three addresses, as in the 192.168.1, lock those in and don't let them move. And then the dot zero means, okay, this is where we're verifying. If you have larger networks, such as college campuses or large businesses, you might see a 255.255.0.0, but that's not for this video. Then finally use for gateway, simply specify the local IP address of your router. This should probably be 192.168.1.1 as it is generally assigned that, but you might have special circumstances. Most routers, if they come from a company, will tell you which address to log in with, and that's the one you should use. So after that, you will know that every time you type in 192.168.1.110 or whatever you specified, you will connect to it. For example, boom, I'm now attaching to my Synology router through that. All right, now let's test out and see how fast this 10 gigabit card really is. On my Synology, I made a RAID 0 out of two 2.5 two inch SSDs, and so we're going to see how fast that is. We're going to go ahead and connect to it, and speed's the one I'm using. So right here, it's got nothing in it, and we're going to use Blackmagic speed test to see how fast this thing is. 
All right, so using Blackmagic speed test, we're gonna be doing a five gigabit test. Since it's five gigabytes, that means that we'll have a better understanding of how fast this thing actually is when performing sequential read and writes, which is what generally is bottlenecked. All right, so we're gonna select it and let's start it and see what happens. All right, so yeah, we are getting 500 megabytes per second right to it. So it should take about 10 seconds. And almost 500 megabytes read from it. Now I am on a very powerful Mac, which means that I'm not gonna be limited by the SMB overhead on this side too much. All right, I'll let this run a little bit longer. So the final tally was I'm averaging 500 read and write, which is definitely SSD limited, but still incredibly fast. All right, so we can see that this thing is a really powerful beast and it's great to have this capability. If you like that tutorial, please watch another and let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you. Bye.